Okay, here's an interesting one that's a reprint back from 2015. So, back five years ago, they came out with this. And I've actually done three about this topic from different standpoints. Uh, from the Scott Iconochron to their uh, Scottish Declaration of Independence that claims that they're part of the biblical people. And uh, a few other accounts and other videos where I mention it back to it. Whenever I was talking about the pics and people like that. So let's just get into this here. But uh, interesting picture here. And it's the it, on, on the bottom part of a chronicle that says this is Scotia and this is Goidelglass and they were a people that came to Scotland long long ago and interesting where they are proposed to have come from so let's get into this Scotta mother of Scotland and daughter of a pharaoh during the 1440s, a Scottish chronicler named Walter Bower sought to trace the history of ancient Scottish people from the earliest times. The result of his endeavor was the creation of a compendium of Scottish history known as the Scotta Chronicon. Perhaps one of the most astounding claims made by Bower in his Scotta Chronicon is that the Scottish people were actually descendants of the ancient Egyptians and could trace their ancestry directly to a daughter of an Egyptian pharaoh known as Scotta. Now, I've done a video about it, and in one of the videos, or this exact moment here, in one of the videos that I did, actually, so there's two on this, is basically a copy where I keep talking over it in certain points, where um, Robert Sepper had done a video, because he linked some pretty cool vids together and everything, and I was doing this more of a verifier where I was like, okay, so remember I made that video about this? Well, here's somebody else making a video of the same thing. And he says a couple of things I didn't say, so I want to go into it. But there were other things that I didn't say too. So as he's going through it, I stop it as I do and I keep cutting in and saying things on that. I, I kind of like doing that somehow where at least somebody's got two-thirds, three-quarters of it going on and I just add to it. Because if y'all have seen, if I started from a dead sheet of paper, I'm subject to go out in left field all over the place. And I keep trying to bring it in, you know, back in and stuff like that. But I feel like it's a little less linked. But if somebody else is trying to make links, I can jump on that link. Um, so there's said to be a Moses connection to Scotta also. The story of Scotta begins with a Greek king named Gaethalos. In one version of the story, which involves Ireland, Gaethalos has been known as Goidelglass. The word Gael is said to have derived from this man's name and, is ori and was originally from the region of Scythia. It is also said that Goidelglass lived during the time of Moses and the latter is said to have cured the former whenever he was bitten by a serpent. So this all goes through a strange deal where they try to put it together and what had ha possibly happened and curing of a serpent and stuff like that. And it's like, wow, that seems to go along with it. The oddity here is that it was supposed to have been a Greek king, but yet he was supposed to have been originally from Scythia, right? And that comes across as strange to most people reading it and everything, but there were connections between them, because where did them Greeks all of a sudden get them chariots out of nowhere? There are certain things that you can use to try to find out, you know, it, you can find one certain thing that a people have. We used to do this with pottery pieces and the way that it looks. So when you do can find something like, no one's got a chariot, no one's got horses. They're using donkeys. They don't have cart things going or nothing yet. Who has the wheel, the cart, the fact of horses and everything else? And sure, the Sumerians pulled it off using oxes and things like this. And, and farmers up until recently used oxes and stuff to help plow fields and everything. It's, still, it's fantastic. And you can eat them. But that one fact shows you connections 
and it shows you connections with like where that came from and then were they really them and were they really not because there was a whole bunch of tattooing and all this weird stuff and bearded people of the Scythians and the Greeks are known not to be bearded well could somebody go over there and just start shaving their beard and everything and catch in with the Greeks like the Greeks did with their Egyptians and all this different stuff and everything entirely possible would he have become a king I don't know that's entirely possible too I guess you know later in that in the Roman times there are people that you know there's a Phoenician people that are running it sometimes you know of Carthage, Carthage and people like that too so uh, pardon me getting a drink it's entirely possible that something like that went on but then whenever you find out testing this from other points of view about where the actual people from the UK come from you'll find that oh it does have to do with those Scythians not necessarily the Greeks but there was a Passover boy and there was an earlier one and then a later one and a final migration type thing too and people don't look at this and it's not shown up but this is the ancient stories where you get the idea of Tuatha Danon and the Danites and the Danube and all that going on and that group coming in but they already come into a group where there's something going on and then another group comes in and the Anglo-Saxons and so you start to get this idea that whenever they develop the mythologies that you have over there these fairies are deifying in mythology in a way the people that had come before in each one of them and it was in a story that we still have today with elves and all this concept that they had back then and it's oh it's a fanciful tale and millions of things have been written about it and it's we've got a rich history of of things you know and video games and just all kinds of stuff and lord of the rings and all that comes out of it and dungeons and dragons and all that comes out of it but whenever you start to look into dungeons and dragons they take stuff from everywhere and everybody's archaic stuff and put that into it to make it a kind of a tales of old and all this and uh so you're generally fighting in with paganistic type of things but there's also deals about hell itself and so on and i've done a recent video where i showed you i'm in hell in this video game and or at least a portion or portal of it and so you know there's all kinds of religious connotations that get put into it and all kinds of other things but one can't be so critical because of their own beliefs. Sometimes to really get down to it, you have to step out of yourself as a third person point of view and go, I know I got this, but let's just pretend I'm a bump on a log right now. And I'm gonna look at all this from a third point of view. And all of a sudden you can see, perhaps you may have had a view that's a little selfish or little whatever let's look at this from a third portion of view what would this person think what would that person think about what I think right now and evaluate that I quite often do do that in my stuff but and, and you have to you have to be your own critic of yourself so you have to be able to to look through things and finding something like they used to tattoo themselves and the pics are well known to be tattooed and you find out later the Egyptians, which we find out out much later, and I've done a video about that. The Egyptians had tattoos and things, and even the earliest forms of them in pre-dynastic times. And we can see that on the walls, whenever they show the different people, that the Libyans that are there are also tattooed, the ancient Berber-type people. And, of course, they still to this day use the uh, different dyes and henna and stuff like that and make fake tattoos and all this type of stuff. But there is real tattooing being found in those and then even pre-dynastic the blonde haired gibbeline mummy known as ginger has been found uh, he had tattoos on him and so it goes way back in the Bedarians and all this type stuff well we have figured out that the Bedarians and the Nakata people derive from a people that were there and a people that came in which looks like the people that we've termed Natufians that are all over the Levant and we're making all these little cattle rings that look just like the cattle rings you see way down in, in the Cape of South Africa. Exact same thing and they're all right over the Jordan area. I've done a recent video about it. 
but all their findings were finding that they were the first people bringing farming down and doing things differently and still hunter gathers and farming along with it and doing things and i said simply whenever we watched whenever i did that video that you know you, you watch things like uh, little house on the prairie and stuff and pa was a little bit of a hunter gatherer and stuff and even the beverly hillbillies were a little bit of a hunter gatherer still and in fact until just recently with all these stores and all these things going on people could easily be hunter gatherers and if you know anybody down south perhaps or all over the states really you can find people that go deer hunting and they with one deer you can have your fill of deer meat for a year in your freezer that's for sure so one deer can last you quite a bit back in the day there was no freezer so what did you do well you shared amongst yourselves and people were different times catching deer and stuff like that and boom because whenever you kill a deer you've got a couple of days here before the meat goes bad and everybody's gonna eat that But tattoo showed something that was real weird but that's just one thing but man you start adding these things up and it gets to be a little bit conspicuous and if you dig into it deeper then there just gets to be a little too much evidence and it starts tipping your scales a little bit and on this endeavor my uh, you know my, my scales have been tipped a long time ago, and then they found out, well, here's this, and that th this scale just starts dropping, and here's this, and here's this. Oh, and this other guy says it too. And you know in their Declaration of Independence it says it? And I'm like, what? Yeah. Let's just go ahead and get into this here. Goida Glass has promised, was also promised by Moses, that no serpent or other poisonous creature will inhabit the western island that his posterity would inhabit one day in his little promised land. One of Goidoglass's grandsons, Newell, was invited to Egypt as an instructor by a pharaoh and eventually married one of his daughters, Scotta. Both Scotland and the Roman name for Ireland, Scotia, are said to be derived from her name, and Scotch whiskey and all kinds of things. But Newell and Scotia's people were later driven from Egypt by a later pharaoh, and wandered around the Mediterranean until they reached Spain. Now, a lot of people connect this, that this is Mary Otten, and that's the daughter with the Otten name, that's Akhenaten, and he was the heretic pharaoh. And after that, Span came through there, that, to take it back to the way that it was, they basically banished these people, or bad things were gonna happen, Slowly but surely, you get choked in the night, and this, that, and the other, and she just left. But because of her parents and the following, she took a lot of people with her. And so you can see that it wasn't just her, but it was a group of people that were perhaps getting into this monotheism idea, and they weren't digging it. So whenever the Hyksos got kicked out and everything, then the 18th Dynasty got going on and so on and rode through that, then you have Akhenaten show up and stuff, and, and these things are happening, you know, back to back to back. They finally were like, I'll get the hell out. Well, you'd think that you'd see something that important on Egyptian writing somewhere, but the Egyptians didn't write down embarrassing things very much at all. Yeah. In fact, whenever they went up north and, and basically pretty much had their ass handed to them that was looked at as being, a, oh, well, we, we had a truce there. It's kind of like whenever you get in a fight, but you do get some licks in, but you get your ass whooped, and then, then they were like, well, it was fair. And you're like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> well, we'll call that fair and go from there. So, but when you look at the information that they come out with and not just this this is a stating of it whenever you dig into the information it it's it looks fairly convincing during the rule of Milad or Milesius whose wife was incidentally also a pharaoh's daughter by the name of Scotia or Scotta Scotia by the way means little flower and uh, they have her grave Scotia's grave and all this stuff and you know this supposed redhead and Mary Queen of Scots 
and Ramsey was a redhead. And if you look at Akhenaten and that lineage that comes off of it, which is the heretic pharaoh and so on, there are lots of blondes and strawberry blondes in that. And I'll show you here in just a minute some of the pictures of those people. And people have later said, well, well, they're the Hyksos then. And it's like, no, that's after they kicked the Hyksos out and got it back going and then the next dynasty. So surely they kicked all these people out and surely if they were all doing that crap, they wouldn't have been, oh, we're going to kick you all out and, well, one of y'all's left, let's make you the president. That isn't the way it worked, people. You can't fake it out like that. And people say, oh, they were, uh, they were black or they were more like the Arabic people now and so it'd be easy to tell them apart. Well, if it is so much, these blonde, blue-eyed people are standing out like a sore thumb. But yet, that's what's there after the fact. But I guess I can show you also, they were there from the earliest dynasties. There's these earliest statues from 3rd, 4th, 5th dynasty and so that have these crystal blue eyes and so on and blonde hair on the walls, all kinds of stuff that I've shown in my videos. So, people say, oh, they were all black-headed. Now, that was a symbolic thing, and they weren't drawing hair real well back then, but then also, they said that they ruled over the black-haired people. Like the Sumerians said, they ruled over the black-haired people, and that might give a connotation to something, too. Well, if you rule over the black-haired people, what color is your hair? Well, in the things, it's all, it's all dark hair, and, well, they found wigs now, and they've got blonde and auburn and all kinds of colored wigs. They haven't found a bright red-headed wig. But I'm guessing that would have been prized in some way, huh? These people heard about Ireland, this Milesius and so on, heard about Ireland and believed it to be the island foresaw by Moses. Although Melid died in Spain, his wife and children eventually did reach and settle in Ireland. And there's a tale about this, but it doesn't personally name things and about this conflict that went on once in elder times where they had had fights with apparently the, the primordial people of the Spain, or the Basque type people, and weren't getting along with them. And it wasn't just they came in a war, you know, like the Vikings showing up like you think of in your mind, which isn't really reality either. But how you, know, you would think of that, not in any way, not an invasion force in any way, a migrational force. They weren't accepted in Spain and they took that next hop down. Who knows, man, they could have been trying to get supplies, but it showed off to where something went wrong, and those people were supposedly to have gone on to the North Islands. And from where Spain is, if you go north, you're going to end up right there. Irish and Scottish origins intertwine, it says. This legendary origin of the Irish people is also shared by the Scots. For the Scots, however, the story did not end in Ireland. From Ireland, descendants of Newell and Scotia traveled to the west coast of Scotland, battled and defeated the Picts, and became the Scottish people. This version of Scottish lineage can also be found in the Declaration of Arbaugh, an important document written in 1320 by the barons and noblemen of Scotland requesting the intervention of the Pope himself on their behalf during the Wars of Independence. In the second paragraph, it is written in the document, that's not it, it's a check. Most Holy Father, we know, and from the chronicles and books of the ancients, we find that among other famous nations, our own, the Scots, have been graced with widespread renown, and journeyed from greater Scythia by the way of the Tyrian Sea and the pillars of Hercules, and dwelt for a long course of time in Spain amongst the most savage people, but nowhere could it be subdued by any people, however barbarous. Hence it became 1,200 years after the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea to its home in the West, where it still lives today. This is that declaration that is there tasseled and everything at the bottom and on a parchment still there they're saying that's a copy of it okay the original looks like that too pretty much maybe a little more eat up Scotia by another name 
Not everyone agrees that Scots originated from Scythia. However, one writer, for instance, speculated that Gaethalos, goidal glass, was neither a Greek king nor a Scythian, but an Egyptian pharaoh himself. In lineage of Akhenaten, well, Akhenaten's lineage leads right to King Tut. So who would this have been? Somebody that would have been in King Tut's stead or something? Or, oh wait, does this actually go back to before this point? Whenever there might have been a conflict between other pharaohs? Where does, hmm. What if we're trying to pin it on Akhenaten and there's more than one time where this type of thing happened? I mean, everybody thinks Egypt's so great, nobody would ever want to leave Egypt, but uh, that's just what we're told to believe in these ideas that these people didn't get around. Huh. In Scotta, Egyptian queen of the Scots, Mary, queen of Scots, is a redhead, Ralph Ellis, he's a pretty good uh, researcher here. He's gone on a bunch of things. I looked at a whole lot of his stuff that goes along with who Jesus really was when he tried to figure it out. And uh, he almost had it there with King Isis of Edessa and things that had happened. And then he tries to put it together with a shawl and a uh, shroud of Turin and things. And it's like, no, that's a little different. And you can't put those three together. And so that's a little off. But also later he came out with another idea. It's like, well, I kept going down that rabbit hole and check out what I found and so on. And he's gone on and to a few different topics and things and I think now he's at the point realizing that Titus was the second coming professed by Josephus himself and the whole nine yards and that's a very telling thing too Ralph Ellis traces the story of Scotta and Gaethalos to a third century BC source Manetho's Egyptica itself and I've done a video about Egyptica and Egypt where Egypt comes from and it's a brother of the people that actually started the Greeks themselves they say it's in their mythology and everything with Egypt using an ancient source it has been argued that Scotty was actually Anxakamun the widow of Tutankhamun huh so it could have been the next part of it Gaethalos, on the other hand, has been argued to have been I. Now, I is the person who is the successor of King Tut. And according to Ellis, also the father of Tutankhamun. But that doesn't seem to be correct for... We've kind of figured out how that goes. But no, people have looked into it, and it's possible that I was related to him but it's doubtful that they would have been his father or he would have been lying for the throne rather than Tutankhamun is that why things went wrong well no they raised him up as a boy king all the way to that point he died whenever he was 19 or whatever so it's an odd fit but um, due to this religious conflict that they had I's reign was cut short and the pharaoh and his court were soon forced into exile like the Irish lesions, and I and Anxan Humun wandered around before settling in Spain several generations later. There was a migration to Ireland and hence to Scotland. And I think that's a confusion of the second wave of Scythians coming in and pointing out it to be a wrong way. Well, these people said that they'd come from the water. You know, the Scythians can come over and hit the Black Sea and come down through there into the Mediterranean out the Pillars of Hercules and take a right and do it all on a boat and don't have to go through the Greek and Roman lands. Isn't that amazing? Here's an old statue of them, but they, you know, they, for proof they try to say, well, look, they defaced all their statues and stuff and we didn't even know that Tutankhamun lived. Uh, in, it, it, was, it was just a a theory kind of thing and they tried to take Akhenaten out of the whole situation because of what he had did and so on like that heretic kings and that they had done that before this is memory damnatio they actually take and destroy your memory 
You know, they're all written on the walls and all time. Well, they took them off the wall and people forgot about them. That's really the only reason we found him in the first place. So l let me show you another little little connective here, if you can. You, you, you think the, the Egyptians, they ain't got nothing to do with that, right? Well, man, I got too many things pulled up here. But we can look at Akhenaten's parents here. I should have it still pulled up. Wow, did I go the wrong way? No, oh, no, my cosmic impact. No, come on, guys. Lord, there's one with about genetics on the Egyptians, but I don't really want to want to show that. I want to show you pictures. Here's one. This is not the not the other one. This is great grandmother here. Great grandmother of Tutankhamun. And Thuya and Yuya. She's a strawberry blonde lady right here and people say well, why are their skin so dark well pink skin whenever you take and make beef jerky out of it turns incredibly dark and they pretty much with the natron tan hide it basically does this type of situation then they usually grease them down with slack these are some of the best mummies that are ever kept out of any of them they've looked at their hair and you can easily tell that's Caucasian hair there I mean their soft curly hair and everything there's really no question on it and uh, there's a little video that shows whenever people go to see him I tried to put uh, her I put that in a video and they, they knocked it here recently and stuff really I was taking about I don't know there was 40 seconds worth of video and oh man can't have that and uh, so let's see if I can find the other picture here well, here's another thing that you can show you, I guess. These are crystallized Egyptian statues. And this is from the earliest of dynasties. This one is said to have ride between the 3rd and 4th dynasty. And there's a bunch of them that are 4th and 5th and 6th dynasty. And they found uh, in a 12th dynasty tomb a cache of things. One of which is said to be Horaha. That is the... <coughs> second pharaoh ever after Menes, and a lot of people say that's Hor, Hor, Horus the younger and that's this or this was the scorpion king and that was it and the, and the way they're working out and they've given too many names to too many people that's Horaha's eyes right there looking at it so um, blue crystal statues and you can tell that's Caucasian here and everything but that's the earliest of dynasties this isn't like some Hyksos got left around or anything like that happened in any way shape or form where is the one that shows her father, though? Do I not have that? Ding, there we go. And let's see if we can get down here to BAM. This right here is Yuya. The one we showed a minute ago was Thuya. This is Yuya. Thuya and Yuya are the great-grandparents of King Tut and leave through that Akhenaten time. And you see what these people look like. That looks like Greg Norman the golfer somewhat because he's so blonde headed. But yeah, and a lot of people say in certain pictures he looks like Abraham Lincoln. So, one thing's for sure. Even the little stubble on his beard, that's all gold and everything. And they try to say, oh, the natron does that. And his hair was probably already a different color. No, they've tested it. And what's funny is they find mummies, they have black hair. They find mummies, they have auburn hair, blonde hair, red hair, all Caucasian, all the way through. Blue-eyed from the start. And so now, that makes you wonder something too. Well, how about if the reality of it is that the people that ended up making up the Egyptians with those Natufians and early European hunter-gatherers as DNA has been shown to Hootie Nacht and the 12th Dynasty has exactly that gear going on and shows up in that recent genetic test where they had over a hundred mummies where they got the genetics three of which they got the full genome like pow the whole thing onto it and they're showing these early Anatolian farmers these Natufian type people in early European 
hunter-gatherers had mixed together and do that. Well, that's what they pinpoint as the Nufians, the people that become the barbarians. Okay, so now we have a where did the Egyptians come from? And it seems like they come from the same stock for the other people that were up there that came down, the Gobekli Tepe people and all of that, it vents out to the right, Karen Basin mummies, all the people from up over there, the Tocharians that we know about and stuff that are there, and where their migration back over was the other one. So in reality, all we have is people separated over a period of time doing the same thing too. You follow me? They migrate out of Egypt, or they migrate out of Scythia and end up over there. They're going to be the same stock too. Sure, there might be a little variation on a theme. Maybe you get M138 over here and you don't see it so much over here, but more over here. Maybe there's a reason for that too. Who's the M38 guy? Where'd he come from? Where'd he go? Anyhow, write down in the comments what you think about this because it's kind of conspicuous and a lot of people try to write it off until they know the reality of the blue-eyed Egyptians all the way from the very start blonde, Ramses was a redhead, all these things, is there, you know, there's a pre-dynastic mummy with this same curly blonde hair here that's a Bedarian, Gibeline mummy, and it shows you the earliest of the Egyptians, and if they have this, then they have the genetics of early Europeans, are people that made Europe up which comes a lot from the Scythians. But like I've showed in other videos, that seems to come from the same type of people. And we know right here in this part we have the Amarna letters, and there are people in the Matani, the Colchis area, and Colchians, that Herodotus even says, yeah, they're just like the Egyptians. And they got a tan and curly hair, kind of like that curly hair we just saw, but that's not unique to anybody around here. What's unique is that they did circumcision and the way that they do textiles and stuff like that. So, there was nothing unique comparative as far as the way they looked, but they did look a lot like those Colchians and Matani type people. Well, we find the Matani are Proto-Indo-Europeans. And the ancient people of Hatti and Hattusians are. Right there at the top of the Tigris-Euphrates. And there are blue-eyed Sumerians that ran everything, too. Sure, their linguistic shows to be a little different, but everybody else's is a Proto-Indo-European dialect. I'm speaking one right now and a derivative of that goes all the way from Ireland to all the way to Sanskrit, believe it or not. In fact, Sanskrit and Irish seem to be a little closer than the stuff that's in between. Just on usage and the way people compiled the language and the variations on a theme of it. But isn't that interesting? Well, the Egyptians had a different dialect. It's Proto-Indo-European dialect is a little different than theirs. They have this Hamo-Semitic or Afro-Asiatic type of linguistics, and it's a little different. But, hey, isn't it very possible? Because there are white people today that speak French or different languages. It's entirely possible when they came down with their idea, their blend of language flipped it a different way. And instead of making you adopt our language, we adopt ours into yours. And it looks like that everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. And it looks like that, if you watch a lot of my videos, that the same ideal and the same concept that heralds religions all around in these different areas all had a common beginning and origin. Anyhow, guys, write down in there, see what you think about this. And uh, we'll continue and go on next. Like I say, this was a kickback that they had done before back in 2015 I've already done a couple of videos about it but hell while I'm doing those 44 and trying to catch up might as well throw another one in it huh peace